Yeah. All right, here we go. At the top. Stand by and action. With the Oceans film, I like to keep it kind of light. I mean, it's not coal mining. How's it going? Try it out. My goal is for people to want to come back because at the end of the day, it's all about talent. It's a lot to presume. And the energy to me should be where the camera is, where the actors are. All right, let's practice one. Please, okay. Can you hear me? All right. That was good timing. And so when the actors show up and you see them do something that's funny or exciting, that's the part of it that makes me the happiest. Yeah, that was great. And that's shuffle by yeah. was funny. I know it could be a wonderful film, but you never know until the picture comes out and people either go to see it or they don't. They win. Ocean's Eleven, it was a very popular picture. It had a script that was working, which is you need, obviously. And it had Steven. I love watching all those guys together. And it's the most fun we've ever had on a film. We're all like, this is a golden moment, and this is the only time it'll ever happen. But. I had a feeling that, that if we came up with a good idea, that we could get everybody back. If we could find a piece of material that was gonna deliver in the same way as the first film. The idea came from, actually, Warner Brothers sent me a script called Honor Among Thieves. Honor Among Thieves was about Francois Talour, the greatest thief in Europe, coming onto the territory of the greatest thief in America, while well, they're both being pursued by an FBI agent. So sort of three characters, a, a triangle. It turned out to be a really terrific fit. The tone of Nolfi's script was very similar to the tone that Oceans has. The hard part in this instance was I didn't want it to be the equivalent of a musician going out and just playing the hits. All of us wanted it to be a new movie with a different feel. The first film was like a throwback to the 70s films of the time, and this aesthetic is more like a 60s uh, film. I think it harks back to those wonderful old European caper movies with a real modern, funky edge. In Ocean's 12, the plot is less central than the characters, and even the plot stuff that is there that drives the movie is very character driven. The first movie, there was a lot more of all the gang, the gang together. And the second one, they're broken up into different little groups. So, how'd it go? <sighs> it was fun in the first one watching them be successful, but I felt it would be more fun in the second film to see them just ground down. So we thought there's more terrain to explore here. Huh. We can take this all a lot further. And once the calls went up, everybody came back. The first time that we shot a scene with uh, all 11 of us back again was in Chicago in a warehouse. We hadn't all been in a room together in a couple years, and we all came in and we reunited. <laughs> We're all just talking, sitting around, and there's kind of little circles happening. These three guys are talking, these two guys are talking. Da, 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 da. And Steven didn't ever say, okay, guys, let's settle down. He would like move you like uh, an inch or two. And then he'd say, okay, yeah, come in a little bit. Next thing he knows, he goes, all right, everybody go away so I can light. That was our rehearsal. Let me, let me design it. Let me, well, let's, let me let the guys know. And the glory of it was that he let our natural social groupings inform the scene rather than the other way around, instead of him forcing it. All of us have a shorthand with each other, and we all sort of understand each other's rhythms, and it just, it just goes like, you know, like, like lightning. 
says he's gonna have a baby. Well, <laughs> yeah. hey, 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 Danny's having a baby, not George. <laughs> I was watching like a bonding moment, like from the bestest buddies at high school getting back together and getting back into the groove. And it was really important that we click because we're about to go on the road. We're heading to Europe. I certainly wasn't thinking in terms of making another Oceans film until we went to Rome to promote the first film. And the idea of setting the whole film in Europe began to take hold. It added this kind of exotic level on it, which is different than the kind of level of exoticism in Vegas. You're walking down a street, and instead of being 50 years old, it's now 1,500 years old. But the hardest part was literally the, the logistics. Pick everybody up, please. It is an incredible thing to try and schedule that many stars. And to go with these guys. I mean, it was obviously a little crazy with, uh, with Brad. Just because Brad evokes a reaction from particularly women that I've never seen before. I don't want to talk about it. There's a kind of shriek, that this a sound that I didn't know humans really made when he comes around. Paparazzi followed us on the roads and they took a million pictures. It's a difficult proposition, but we just found locations that were out of this world. They did not get dead. Really? This is the year you were born? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a 42? <laughs> is this when you were born, George? This one? <laughs> we tried to find in Europe what we had in Vegas and so that heightened, very stylized, beautiful places. In the introduction to Tallur, we had decided to go to Monte Carlo, and I really wanted it to feel like To Catch a Thief, that real old-time glamour and shooting at the, the perfect time of day. Action! But I didn't want to turn the film into a travelogue. I wanted the way in which we saw Europe to be sort of naturalistic and always driven by what the characters were doing and where they were going. Where are we going? Amsterdam. Amsterdam, it's a gorgeous city built on canals and a lot of history. And I was surprised that no one had really taken advantage of this city before shooting. It was still a little chilly there, so the feel of it was almost sort of Eastern Bloc in a way. It felt like old films like The Spy Who Came In From The Cold and that kind of thing. Again, this is the movie in which everything goes wrong from the get-go. Background action and action. So when we started talking about the film and what each of the heists should be, this whole issue of Amsterdam being built on the water and some of the houses being tilted seemed to work. Nolfi and I, came up with this idea of like, well, they should have to move a house, like an entire house. The whole house. We're just raising it slightly. We just thought it was a very funny way to um, put them in a situation where they had to do an incredible amount of work to do what ultimately was a very tiny shift and change. So it had a thematic element that played to the humor of the film. It's really our best plan, guys, considering it's our only plan. We got to use the city in a way that wasn't incidental. How's it after that been? Okay. It's not a bad town. Steven really wanted to speak to the characters by using locations. Having that a texture to who these people are and how they function within the story. Color was all about formality and sort of this operatic quality to him. So scouting Talor's house on all the great lakes of northern Italy. It was literally like a triptych of famous villas that I had studied in school. Yet each one was more magnificent than the next. And then, almost by accident, we ended up looking at Lake Como and found a villa that was formerly owned by the family of Lucchino Visconti, a famous Italian director. And it was a mile from Clooney's house. And so a group of us ended up staying there. Isn't this gorgeous? Taking a boat to work, which was pretty decadent. 
was just a wild coincidence, but it was very funny to see that many sort of stars hanging out in these windows. It was fun. Coleman was like summer camp. <laughs> We'd be sitting around the pool about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'd say, who's at work right now? I worked particularly hard there. I had um, no scenes there um, and was there for 10 days. Uh, so that was, that was, you know, obviously, you know, trying for me. Don't be mean. I won't. I, I gotta get through two lines here. Watch I, me. I know, I don't have any words. Don't, you don't. you want to take a couple of those woes, right? <laughs> whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Here we go. The cast. They had a lot of fun, but it wasn't just all play. I mean, it might have seemed like that, but it was also a lot of work, too. <laughs> In Rome in particular, it was certainly shooting in these locations during the height of the tourist season. So it was a big challenge. Let's get a better security perimeter in here. And some of the places we shot in, no matter what we did, we couldn't control it. So the way we got around that is by going in, Stephen with the camera and with the actors, and grabbing a scene before the general public found out who was there. And that's why in some of those scenes that you'll see in Rome, it's very kinetic, because some of that energy is actual real live city energy. And from the different piazzas to all the restaurants and museums there, it's just a natural backdrop for a romance. We all agree this should be Brad's movie. It should be Rusty's film in a way. Do we know each other? Um, I think I saw you yesterday. Catherine was somebody we started discussing very early on, and it was a crucial piece of casting because basically you have a, a sequel that you could argue centers around a character that doesn't appear in the first film. And so it needed somebody who could really play at that level. Oh, man. Action. You catch a lot of thieves? I bet you do. There's always another. It was a little intimidating at first, but it's a wonderful environment in which to play. And I find when I work with Stephen, he lets you express how you feel and just go for it. I think it's all about how long you take before you sit down so that you're making sure it's cool, which it is. Stephen knows what makes a good performance, and he really nurtures that. And I think being in Europe was affecting how he was working and thinking differently. But if we could talk about, if you just riff a little bit about how you like Rome, it's just chit chat. He felt a little more free to try some things that you might consider a little artier, perhaps. Hi, hello. Hi, can you see yourself? The fact that Stevens is his own cameraman, he would kind of have to dance with you a lot of times, you know? You definitely see the influence of the French New Wave and a kind of freewheeling camera work. And in 48 hours, the three of your pictures are going to be in every police station in Europe. And Steven Soderbergh, I mean, he does want to challenge himself all the time. So in some ways, he has license in the sequel to go a little more crazy um, to, make it, to make it more fresh for himself. Like, I think he likes to play with time. He likes to mess with chronology a bit, so you have freeze frames. You have flashbacks within flashback. And so the Ocean's films are really trying to do something different from what the last one did. And one of the biggest contributors to that actually was David Holmes, the composer. David and I went in saying, we're starting from scratch. We want a different type of score. I suppose the difference between 11 and 12 is that 12 is definitely a much more European, more experimental kind of soundtrack. We were using marxophones. Electric harpsichords, dulcimers. Lots of just weird instruments. I mean, some of the music that I have sort of made for some of the Ocean's movies, I'm kind of like, I can't believe we're getting this in the movie. But I think with Steven, he'll try anything. There are no rules. That was the spirit it was made in. It seemed to change and grow as we shot it. A kernel of an idea popped. I'm like, hey, maybe we'll go this way.
This don't bother you. Of course it bothers me, mate, but what the f do you want me to do about it? Well, it's f up. Don's storyline is that he's gone into the music business and he's trying to put together an album. And so Stephen thought for the movie or just for <laughs> for us, we'd you know shoot Don at all the locations that we're traveling around, then have a little uh, music video. This is ridiculous. These things don't work. I'm like emotionally in a in a, in a terrible place. I don't like this. Casey and I went a little over the top of some things in a good way. How old do you think I am? 48? 50? 53? <laughs> oh, she's 12, it's less about plot. Even though there's a good plot in it, but I feel like the characters are much more deeply investigated. Just remember, everything depends on this. Okay, I tried calling you all yesterday. <laughs> Linus gets this chance to, you know, be a bigger player in the in the in the grand scheme of things, despite the fact that he's basically not quite ready. What did I say? You called his niece a whore. A very cheap one. What? She's seven. Currently confined to bed. With oh her God! Oh no! What's fun about that, obviously, is that there are many, many opportunities to embarrass him, and also that Matt is so willing to embrace those qualities in Linus that make him an easy target. Hey, can I ask you something? Do you ever notice that Pat is gonna ask? If you can ask me something, give me room to reply. Unless you're asking rhetorically, in which case the answer is obvious, yes. Can, can I ask you yes. something? Thank you. I was coming right off the Bourne movie, so I think it was in response to that. I was so sick of being right in every scene that I, then I wanted to play someone who bumbled a little more. Hey, remember the time your mom had to come to Rome to bed? I think Matt's performance in the film is, is really a sort of comic gem. I mean, he really, really filled Linus up in a way that he didn't have the opportunity to do in the first film. Okay, but you are a much And there are scenes in Ocean's 12 in which the group is interacting that I think are much more fun than the first one just because the, the actors themselves were so comfortable and, and had spent more time together. What, what is that? My it's face. face. No, it's not my face, you animal. <laughs> the Amsterdam planning sequence is my favorite performance piece in the movie, because just listening to all of them interact and overlap and take the wind out of each other is just really fun. Five exterior cameras? Mm -hmm. This guy's a freak. Super yeah. freak. What about going through the roof? No. Two more cameras. Pressure sense, please don't touch And there's a, a laser net over the trap door leading down. Smoke the freak out. Smoke yeah. yeah. the yeah. freak yeah. out. Hey! We just kind of went within. Everybody in the scene has comic timing and was playing off of each other and just going with whatever the other person did. Would you call Emily Dickinson a freak? Are you hosting a telecon we don't know about? Who's Emily Dickinson? <laughs> <laughs> Elliot Gould, man. I remember we were kind of improvising back and forth. Every time I would say something, he would one-up me. I think that Stephen had told Scott to try to give Ruben a hard time. And so I, I said, you know, if, if you keep giving me a hard time, I'm going to shit on your shoes. How do you think it feels when you're sitting down on the toilet and someone's banging on the door? Well, I got to sit down on the toilet, I was, otherwise I'm going to shit on your feet. Come on, Frank. Trying to keep a straight face and also trying to get the last word on and try to out-improvise uh, Elliot Gould. And I lost uh, over and over and over again. They're all funny. They all have great stuff to do, and I love watching that, just seeing these guys bounce off each other in a way that, that I think is genuine. <laughs> but as much fun as we were having, the narrative line was always in the capable hands of Steven, so. Uh, Remember that one take in the, in the hotel suite where we did it? Oh, like super, super fast. Oh, really yeah. talked as I fast as it. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Nolfi and I were working on the script constantly. We went through a long process of idea generation. I think it's fair to say we could probably have written five scripts from the number of ideas that we developed. 
there was one huge sequence that we ended up eliminating that involved the Oceans Gang robbing a U2 concert in Paris. That stayed in the script until very late in the game, until we realized it was just too much. Are we shooting the what? We took a lot of chances. The fact that most of the big stars of our movie get arrested. There are a lot of movies that sometimes have a final twist, but this has twist upon twist upon twist. And then, of course, I don't know who got the idea for using Julia Roberts to play Julia Roberts, but that's one of the real creative things that is in, in 12. I assume that you have some kind of a plan to get him out. Actually, she sounds like her. No, she needs a southern accent. Can you do a southern accent? She's from the south. What the hell is going on with you guys? We had to figure out how are we going to give Tess something that's really interesting to do. Well, we want to involve her in the heist. So uh, we just kept batting ideas back and forth and snapped into focus at some point. What if she plays herself? That's a very postmodern idea and, and illegal in a certain creative sense. There were a lot of people that were very nervous about it. The studio was very nervous about it, and Julia was nervous about it. And I can understand why. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very odd request. We need someone famous! Why did you get someone famous? The four weddings and a funeral. She wasn't in four weddings and a funeral. I, I wasn't in four weddings and a funeral. There's some question of whether or not you want to spoof yourself. It's a dangerous step for an actor because you're sort of acknowledging all of the things that people have said about you and you're either validating them or making fun of them. So it's always a tricky thing, but I think Steven doing it made a big difference. I'm gonna try to kill myself for this one, I'm in jail. When you have the security of a really close relationship, you can say, I can't do this, or can't we come up with something else? And Steven's always been a person who's incredibly open to that because he's changed things around so much and made it to where I really responded to it and really liked it. And Julia was the one who suggested, well, don't you think it would be a good idea if I ran into somebody that I knew, you know, that, that quote, Julia knows? And she said, well, I know Bruce pretty well, he's a good friend. And we played ourselves once before in The Player, the Robert Altman film. He's somebody who I feel really comfortable with in this situation. To my mind, that was really the piece that, that made it work. Action. I think it was one of my favorite scenes to shoot. It was just so ridiculous and fun. And Matt's being a goof running around in circles and trying to orchestrate the whole thing, and I'm just kind of tagging along, you know? <laughs> the energy that just sort of took over in the room and this frenetic pace that we started playing the scene, at, it just kind of happened. I'm going to cancel my lunch and come with you guys. Oh, boy. Well, that's the other thing that I liked about it, was the opportunity for both Julia and Bruce to send up themselves and the idea of themselves. And they were fearless about it. You know, whenever we'd throw in some line that was self-critical, they, they thought it was even funnier. You don't even have to talk if you don't want to. You just, you smile. You give them a big smile. You wave at the camera. That's all she ever does. No, but if you do say something, don't forget your accent, all right? Drop your Gs and longer vowels. Soderbergh is playing with stardom. He's playing with what it means to be an actor and so subverting it. But the joke is, is not on the stars. They're clearly in on the joke. And you can't do that in a normal studio movie. But, you know, we can do it in this. Nothing is off limits. Let me take a look at that. I think the party scene at the end of 12 was a perfect way to end 12 because it seemed to reflect exactly what was going on in the making of 12. I'm gonna see you guys. Hey. Uh, <laughs> it looks like they just sort of started hanging out and having fun and the camera was going. I mean, what sort of Hollywood film do you get a kind of uncensored look at the celebrities of our society? We had a great time. <laughs> Any one of the parts I would have loved to have played because they're all really funny. Ooh. And Steven, he sticks his neck way out all the time. <laughs> we 
wrote a lot of material and shot a lot of stuff that we ended up pulling away. But I loved the luxury of being able to try those different things. And it's fun when you have people that are willing to explore with you, and that's what I'm looking for. I think that's why this core group has sort of stayed together, is that they like taking left turns as much as I do. Is this Don's album cover? Okay, great. Good to see you, man.